No, folks, no matter how many times I listen to that, I still get the chills. That's one of the best moments in sports, baseball, you name it, Yankee history. It's one of the best. And, of course, that was the legendary number seven of the iconic New York Yankees, the late, great Mickey Mantle. And it's an honor today because we have his second oldest son on with us who's going to share some great stories about his father, stories about the family. And I am delighted to introduce to you uh david mantle and david i want to thank you for coming on today it's a real honor hey no problem i'm glad uh i'm a i'm still here to do it yeah exactly so david i was thinking about it uh yesterday when i knew we were going to do this you were probably five or six years old when that big home run chase in 61 was going on correct yeah i was born in 55 and uh, Mickey was uh, 53, and then, of course, Billy was 57, and uh, Danny was 1960. But, uh, yeah, I was uh, still pretty young, but, you know, uh, we really don't remember much about it. But, you know, of course, we got to uh, relive it a bunch of times. Yeah, and let me, you know, one of the things, too, if I remember correctly, I, I remember reading about this years ago, your father never – encourage i wouldn't say encouraged but he never forced you guys to play baseball or to play any sport he just said that if you ever played a sport he wanted you to give your very best at it and i think you gravitated more more towards football correct oh yes if uh you know for me but uh playing football i've always joked about it but uh you know in the off season when dad was home god we'd get the neighborhood kids and we had games in the backyard and dad was quarterback for both sides but you know we'd play that all winter uh but uh at baseball I, I i wasn't too bad but you know it's like i've always said in football you don't strike out <laughs> right one thing about one thing about football the difference between football and baseball is i mean it's as you know it's very grueling i mean you know you're going out there every day and back then too when you played i mean the, the rules weren't what they are now. I mean, I'm sure you guys probably hit every day in practice, and then you got to play a game on a Saturday morning or Friday night. So, I mean, that's quite the grind, but I, I assume you love that sport very much. Oh, uh, baseball is still my favorite. But uh, what I was also going to mention, and uh, I don't mind bragging about Mickey Jr., uh, I don't know when he was, uh, I think like that, he was blessed. Any sport Mickey did, uh, he was just great at it. I mean, he could do, uh, he played golf great with dad. In fact, dad would take him to, uh, a lot of the tournaments. And, uh, one time they came home and I think it was dad that got the hole in one, but they, uh, came driving home in a brand new, uh, Mustang that he gave to, uh, my little brother, Billy and Billy went out and wrecked it. <laughs> right. And, you know, I, I'm glad you brought up Billy because I, I often wonder about this. I know your father had a great friendship with Billy Martin. Was oh, Billy yeah. named after Billy Martin? I'm assuming. Yep. Yeah, he sure was. Right. And you know, the thing is too, uh, David is, I mean, you think about, and I had Billy Martin Jr. on. And oh, what's cool. Really, yeah. What's really amazing to me talking to you, talking to Billy Jr. is you guys have carried on your own legacies. I mean, you do a lot of great things with the foundation, you know, with the fa your father's foundation and Billy Jr. has been a tremendous agent. He's uh, represented a lot of people in every aspect of, uh, you know, whether it's sports, Hollywood, whatever the case. So, I mean, I think both 
uh, fathers, Billy and Mickey, would be very proud of their sons today. Oh, well, I hope they would, uh, you know, because uh, we were very proud of them. And I tell you what was really cool, too, though, is, you know, here Dad and Billy were uh, such great friends. And, of course, you know, they called each other Pard. And uh, me and Billy Jr., we'll do that, too. We call each other Pard. But yeah. uh, you know, he just lives in Arlington, which ain't too far from a Dallas area. And so, you know, we get to see each other as often as we can. And it's always great to hang around him because Billy's he, I, he's almost kind of like his dad. He's got a lot of stories. Yeah. And the thing is, I wanted to ask you about, David. Um, I know growing up, your father, he grew up with a lot of sadness. I know that, uh, you know, as he, I think his father was what, maybe 38, 39 years old when he passed away? Yeah, something right. like and I know his father was like somebody that he really looked up to, probably his best friend. And I mean, he always encouraged him, like your father encouraged you guys to always give your very best. So, I mean, growing up, people, they tend to forget as great of great as an athlete as he was, there was a lot of sadness when he was growing up. Oh, yes. You know, uh, I don't know if a lot of people know it, but, you know, uh, dad, of course, you know, in little towns, you play every sport. And he also played football, and he got kicked in the leg or something. And this is how uh, they found out that he had that osteomyelitis. Uh, uh, and thank God, uh, Grandma Mantle, you know, they were wanting to uh, amputate Dad's leg, and she said no. And luckily, you know, that was the uh, just kind of like the very beginning of uh, penicillin, and that's what I think saved Dad's leg. But uh, you know, he it back then, you know, his dad. Uh, they would also play, uh, uh, you know, uh, his dad would pitch to him one way and then his grandfather pitched to him the other way. And that's uh, his dad was able to see that, you know, platooning was going to be it. And so he made dad the switch hitter. Right. And I mean, what a switch hitter he was. I mean, he kind of in a lot of ways, he is the first of the many who had a successful career switch hit. And I mean, I think Eddie Murray, who was a tremendous switch hitter, you know, had over five home, 500 home runs, but your father really kind of was, you know, that first person who really opened the door for switch hitters. Oh yes, it was. And then, you know, but speaking of home runs, I know we'll probably talk more about them later, but uh, Hank and Moose once told us, you know, we did those fantasy camps, uh, but Hank and Moose once told uh me and Mickey Jr. that, uh, you know, playing in Yankee Stadium, I think it was 460 to center. And uh, they said that dad hit two to 300 more home runs, or not home runs, but balls that went to the monuments in Yankee Stadium. They said if he had played anywhere else, those would have been home runs. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's funny, too, because let me ask you this. I know you were you weren't even born yet when he was starting to really come onto the scene and you got to see him a lot in the sixties, obviously. Right. But, but when you think about it, you, you had Babe Ruth, you had Lou Gehrig, you had Joe DiMaggio. Those were the three big Yankees, but people love Joe DiMaggio. So yes. after Joe retired, the Yankees really didn't have that next big Yankee guy that fans were fascinated with until your father came. And I mean, your father in a lot of ways, I mean, he really, he really was, that celebrity that every let's face it david um a lot of kids a lot of parents named their kids joe or they named their daughters joe d after yep. joe dimaggio and the same thing for your father a lot of uh parents were naming their kids after your father so he really was that next big superstar after joe dimaggio retired it's great you know when we i do get out and uh, do stuff and you know uh we'll do uh card shows every now and then i don't know why they want me there but uh you know I, I don't charge for autographs or nothing and we do one here in uh the dallas or allen texas and it's every other month but you know i just pass out uh autographs to kids but you know people come up to me and man i don't know how many people over the years i've met said man i'm named after your dad <laughs> yeah you know i mean uh you know i could just speak for my father my father loved watching your father play i mean to this day you know, it doesn't matter. And he's seen a ton of championships since uh, your father retired and Mickey Mantle will always be number one. But I mean, that's the thing, too, is one thing that I would always see just watching old film and stuff like that is that 
your father was very respectful to the fans. If a fan wanted to shake his hand, he went out of his way to shake their hand. He was very friendly when he saw them out and about. So he never got caught up in all that celebrity. He still stayed as the person he was from the time, you know, before he became a big time player. Oh, yeah. I think being from Oklahoma and the humble, uh, you know, background they had him growing up. I mean, it was they were growing up, you know, like most Americans. Uh, it was the hard times then. And of course, being in the little uh, mining town and stuff of, you know, commerce uh, over, you know, by the mines there and stuff. It was, uh, you know, a hard time for his dad. But uh, dad was always very humble. And I told, you know, like I was texting you, he even told us, he goes, man, if I ever catch you all acting better than anybody else, I'm going to knock you on your butt. <laughs> yeah, and that's the way his father uh, was yeah. with him. Because tell, share the story with us, David, because I know Mickey has told it many times that he was having a tough, uh, maybe it was in the minors, might have been spring training, and your grandfather basically said to him, I thought I raised a man, and you're really nothing but a coward. So talk about that yeah, story that was a little it. bit. You know, Dad was, uh, he was with the Yankees, and uh, he was in a slump. He was not hitting. So Casey and them, they sent him down to Kansas City. And, uh, you know, he got down there and he was just discouraged. And, you know, he was, you know, I guess just needing his dad to give him a pep talk or something. But he got down there and called his dad and said, hey, you know, come get me. And so uh, next thing he knows, his dad's at the door of the hotel and he told him to pack. And then while dad was packing uh, his suitcase, uh, his father Mutt said that, uh, man, I thought I raised a man and you turned out to be nothing but a, I can't really remember. I don't know if it was a baby or something like that, but he goes, man, I thought I raised a man. And after that kind of pep talk, uh, if you can call it that, dad said, man, dad, I'm sorry. Uh, let, let me give it another try. And he went back and started hitting in Kansas City and then they brought him right back up. And of course, you know, that first World Series, I... I, I don't know what plan that was, but, you know, his, you know, first World Series, he's going for a ball. And, of course, you know, Joe D was one of his uh, uh, idols, too. And uh, Joe D, people say he called him off late. I don't know. But uh, dad went to stop and uh, all of dad's knees, uh, one of his cleats got caught in a uh, uh, drainage thing, I think. And just all that weight went on his uh, knee. And uh, even Yogi told us once, he goes, you could hear it. You could have heard it pop when they were in the dugout. They heard it. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought it up. I was going to talk about the movie eventually. And I'm just going to oh, bring okay. up, well, I'm going to bring up one thing now about the movie. We'll talk about it more. But in that movie, you kind of sense that you got the feeling him and Joe DiMaggio didn't like each other. But I think sometimes this is just my opinion. You know better than me. I think the media tends to over dramatize that thing i mean did i really didn't think they disliked each other maybe they weren't great buddies but th it's a business too but i never sensed that they didn't like each other anytime i saw them at old timers they they seemed to get along very well yeah but you know from what i've heard too from other uh yankees and stuff joe d wasn't really much of a talker i don't think yeah uh, but you know that was one of dad's idols too you know here he's playing with joe d and they're putting this pressure on him since it was Joe's last year that, hey, you know, it's your first year here. And look, uh, after Joe leaves, you're going to have to step up and do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I often think about this, David. I mean, uh, your mother, I have a ton of respect for her because it's not easy raising four boys, but she was the lone woman in the house. But I mean, you also we talk about your dad and he was as tough as nails, but your mother is a pretty tough lady, too. And she overcame some uh, illnesses over the years and she lived a very long time as well. Yes. Uh, one thing about mom too is uh, uh, I've, I've always joked, uh, you know, you mentioned four boys, but uh, hell dad even kind of joked about it. He goes, man, she raised five kids, you know, counting him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, like, uh, and very respected lady. I mean, over the years you see her like talking about different things i mean she really like in a lot of ways was his big support system back then oh yeah mom was uh to me you know court uh very classy 
But, you know, it's just like I've kind of mentioned to you in some of the uh, taxes and stuff that, uh, you know, the, the players hung out, the wives hung out, and us kids hung out. And uh, I can remember at spring trainings, you know, like uh, Joan uh, Ford would come up and they'd be around. It was just all the ladies back then. They were all classy. You don't remember back then when they went to ball games, uh, they all wore gloves and stuff. I always thought that was funny. You're at a ball game. And of course, you know, New York wasn't too hot, but everybody's wearing gloves and that, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah. And let me ask you this, David. Um, what was the experience like for you by the time I, I want to say when you were like nine or 10 years old, because you're a little older by then and you could kind of really take in the experience of Yankee Stadium and stuff like that. I mean, that had to just be so much fun. Your summers had to be the best just hanging out at that ballpark. Oh, yeah. When we lived in uh, we lived right over in New Jersey, right across the bridge there uh, by Bronx and stuff. And uh you know, we got to go to the ballpark a lot if we wanted to, or we we got to meet a, a lot of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the, you know, neighborhood kids and stuff. And uh, we hung around there and played ball in the parks and, you know, just hung out. So that was fun. But the most fun I had was if we were at the ballpark, you know, if like uh, we'd go to Yogi's and see his kids and hang out with them. And then also too, of course, Whitey Ford's. Yeah. And I mean, Fun. You, you talk about uh, Yogi. It seems like to me, Yogi had to be not only was he a great player, a great teammate, but he had to be that type of guy, too, that kind of relaxed everybody because you could just tell that Yogi, he was a very funny guy as well. Oh, and yeah. I'm sure yeah. having him around the clubhouse for that, too, was huge for your father and his teammates. Yes. Uh, Yogi was great. And, uh, you know, dad, dad always he, you know, even in the, after retiring and stuff, he still told jokes that Yogi had, you know, it was just, it was, of course, they all loved uh, playing jokes on everybody. I remember uh, one, you know, when Joe Pepitone and, you know, God bless him, he just passed away. Yeah, yeah. Ago. Uh, but, you know, he first wanted to bring a hairdryer to the locker room and uh, <laughs> Dad would put a uh, baby powder in it. And when he'd turn it on, he'd go everywhere. Yeah. One of the teammates I wanted to bring up because I, like I said, I mean, you didn't get to watch your father till, you know, the sixties, obviously, and really like recognize it, but you can't talk about your father without talking about Roger Maris. And I got to tell you, David, that I am so jealous that I never got to see that home run chase because media aside, that had to be for a Yankee fan seeing that every day, must see TV every day. It was. And, uh, sorry, did you, you say something else? No, go ahead. No, okay. Go ahead. Uh, Dad uh, would joke, and so would Roger. You know, uh, some of the sports writers had it. Oh, they were at each other's throats or whatever. And uh, they'd take turns in the morning, you know, and they'd throw, you know, the paper to the other one and said, Look what they're saying about us. We're fighting again. <laughs> <laughs> so Dad yeah. lived with Roger that uh, year. Him and Yeah, Roger. yeah. I, and, the thing is, too, that I remember watching a special one time on Roger Maris is just like how shaken up your father was when he found out Roger died. And I'm sorry if you dislike a person, you're not going to like you're going to feel sad, but you're not going to, you know, do what Mickey did. Mickey was visibly shaken by that. So, oh. I mean, I think that if I I wasn't there, but I would have to believe that they were rooting for each other that year. Oh, I, I guarantee you they were. And, you know, of course, dad got injured and he wanted Roger to do it. He wanted uh, him to break the record. But also, too, I remember it was the very beginning of like uh, those fantasy baseball camps. Yeah. Uh, dad and Whitey and God, I forgot what other Yankees were there. But I, I remember I worked in restaurants. I was at the restaurant opening it up. And, uh, you know, in the bars, you always have those TVs. They yeah. have to be on. And uh, they had interviewed Whitey and everything like that. And this was after, you know, Roger had passed away. And then dad got on there and uh, uh, the reporter asked dad a question and he just, he lost it. He had to walk off the camera. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the one I was talking about. I mean, that was uh, a, a real tough day, especially if you rooted for the New York Yankees. But, uh, you know, talk about that a little bit in the movie, because that was one thing I, you know, there's a couple of things I didn't like. There were things I really liked, but I really liked 
in that movie that uh, Billy Crystal got it right in the sense that he made sure that viewers knew these guys were friends. And I mean, even though they were going at it with each other for this home run chase and they, you know, it was like uh, to see who could outdo the other. They both respected each other. And I think you could just see that they were great friends. Yes, uh, uh, they were and stuff. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, they would, uh, like you said, rooting for each other. And, uh, you know, when dad got injured, it's like I just mentioned, uh, you know, he pulled for uh, Roger uh, all the way. And, uh, you know, it was just uh, Roger was just a quiet guy. And uh, and uh, what you know what dad also said too that year and, you know, he used to get all the booze and uh, Roger was getting them that year. And he goes, well, that's probably why I did so good. That was like one year that nobody was booing me. I was having a good time. Yeah. And um, the thing of it is, too, is that, I mean, I think in a lot of ways that just uh, got baseball even more popular than it already was, because, I mean, you had these two guys going for a record that at the time was, you know, nobody even thought that it could ever be broken. And, you know, that was another thing that I didn't like as much as, you know, in the movie. But I believe it, it was probably true in real life is that. You know, they were trying to, like, discredit the two of them if they didn't do it in 154 games. And I thought that was unfair because at the end of the day, you can't control how many games you play in a season. And you also have to remember, too, I mean, in your father's case, he missed quite a few games with injuries. So it's not like he played 162 games, and it's not like Roger did either, you know? No, but, you know, uh, that's like uh, that asterisk. Uh, dad never understood that either. You know, as far as he knows, uh, he broke the record and that was it. And, uh, of course, you know, uh, of course, Judge uh, broke it last year, but uh, uh, Roger had it for, what, 61 years. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you that, too. I know at the time the Maris family appreciated what Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa were doing, but – how how do you feel now? No, I mean, how did you feel, say, 2004 when you saw all this stuff coming out? I mean, did you feel like these guys really disrespected Roger and your father and Babe Ruth for that matter as well? Uh, I don't know if disrespected, but I just I just felt, you know, uh, you know, using, uh, you know, the enhancing drugs and stuff. It just it wasn't the same. And also, too, when you look at McGuire and stuff. God, he must have been a foot taller than Dan and Roger and, you know, a lot bigger. But, uh, you know, it, that was a different time. But, you know, uh, since then, you know, they've apologized, I think, for, uh, you know, using those drugs and whatever they were and uh, the uh, enhancement stuff. But, uh, uh, I mean, what- let me ask you, how do you feel about the Hall of Fame for those guys? I mean, do you think the Hall of Fame should keep them out or Here's my problem with it, David, is the fact that I believe baseball knew this was going on when this record was being chased. I really do. I don't think baseball was really blind when it came to these guys using uh, performance enhancement drugs, you know? No, I'm sure it it was, uh, you know, everybody talks. So, you know, there's probably people in the locker room, too, that, you know, you never know. Uh, And then also, too, of course, the... uh, uh, Major League Baseball probably had their uh, uh, little spies in there too, so uh, you just never know. But uh, I, I've just uh, never really, uh, I, I didn't like it. But you know, I'm not going to judge them. Right. So let me ask you, David. Um, what? Obviously, like I said, um, you were too little in the late '50s to really uh, appreciate what Dad did, but. What was your favorite season that you got to see dad play? I mean, I know he retired after 68, but what was your favorite season that you got to see him play? Oh, golly, man. There was there was a lot of them. I tell you what, uh, it's kind of sad. It seems like I really don't remember many. What I remember more is uh, going to spring training, <clears throat> excuse me, and hanging out with, uh, like we said, you know, when we were up there for the uh, season, uh, the ball players' kids. Uh, Because at the uh, Galt Ocean Mile where we stayed, uh, Whitey was on the bottom story, and we were on the second story right above him in the rooms. And so, I mean, we were, shoot, we only had uh, 
tutoring from eight to noon. And then the rest of the days, man, we were on the beach with the Ford kids and all the other ball player kids. And then if they had a game or just practice, the players would come back and they'd be around the pool with all the wives. I mean, I really thought it, it was a family to me. I remember playing shuffleboard with Phil Rizzuto and got, and then I wish I could remember the name. It was a pitcher, but we thought it was so cool. He'd walk on his uh, hands into the ocean. <laughs> I wish <laughs> a pitcher. That's all I remember. Right. And I mean, in the six, the late sixties, the Yankees kind of went into a downward spiral. I think CBS owned them and they just weren't being run right. And it was some bad years, but, Mickey still performed at the level that fans expected. But I wanted to ask you that. How tough was that for him sometimes to, you know, go home? And I'm sure there was, uh, he felt a lot of pressure to perform because he knew that the team wasn't doing as well and that a, a lot of times fans were coming out to see him. I mean, did it ever get to him a little bit? Oh, yeah, because dad, oh, he, he was the perfectionist. And, uh, you know, if he had struck out too many times or uh, during a game or hadn't hit a home run or even a base hit, uh, he got really hard on himself, you know, and he would, uh, you know, take it upon himself that it was his fault and that and this. But, you know, it's uh, he came to realize, you know, what was good about the Yankees then, uh, they played as a team, you know, and they hung out as a team and all that. So, I mean... I think that's one reason they won so much because they all, they were friends. There was no animosity. They all loved each other and they played as a team. But, uh, you know, dad, he did, even uh, if it was a close game, he, he didn't like losing at all. Yeah. And I'm sure he was so used to winning because think about it <laughs> from, from 1951 till uh, 64 when they won their yeah, last 64. pennant. He went 14 years of always having a chance to win a World Series. And then you go those last four years of your career and you're not doing as well. I'm sure that was probably tough for him to take because he was so used to success. Oh, yeah. That, I tell you what. It's like I just mentioned. He hated losing. And, uh, you know, you get used to going to all those World Series and playing in, uh, you know, uh, the World Series. And, it, you know, it's always nice to uh, – uh, you know, get that ring. Yeah. And the other thing too, David, that uh, back then too, don't get me wrong. I do believe players want to win today, but back then players really wanted to win because oh. you also got bonuses for bonuses. winning that world series and players didn't make the money back then that obviously they're making today or even made 30 years ago. So, I mean, a lot of times you relied on that bonus money because they sure that, did. Because, you know, a lot of them had to have off-season jobs until the season started. Well, I was getting ready to mention that. Uh, Dad came back to uh, Commerce, Oklahoma, and he would be, uh, go back to the mines with his dad. Of course, that kept his muscles up. But, you know, it's like uh, some of the other players uh, got, I think, I forgot who, sold cars, whatever they could do. But they'd go back in the off-seasons. And, uh, you know, they didn't relax like it is now. I mean, they went back and still had to work. Yeah, and I think about this too, David. Uh, but those bonuses came in really handy. I'm serious. Yeah, oh, I'm sure they did. And I also think about this. There was a show. It didn't last long. Unfortunately, the uh, host passed away the same year the show came out. But there was a show called Home Run Derby. Home Run Derby. And Dad, I and Dad participated in that. And I'm sure for a lot of players, that was also good to do because that was extra money. I mean, back then. Yeah. People don't realize you had to make ends meet, and that's what these guys had to do to uh, support their families. God, I wish I could remember what he got paid for that. Uh, it wasn't very much, but, you know, it was fun, and, uh, you know, he enjoyed it. You know, I know he did uh, one or two with Willie and uh, probably all the, you know, the big hitters back then, they all took turns doing it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's like you said, it didn't last long, but – it. I, I still love watching those old ones if you get a chance. Oh, yeah. They are a lot of fun. And, I mean, again, I mean, one guy I want to bring up because if while Mickey was the guy for the Yankees, this guy was the guy for the Giants, and that was really right. amazing. And you know what? Like, that's another part of me that gets very jealous that I didn't get to see. Now, I've seen great players. I'm not going to say I haven't. But I really hate that I didn't get to see 
Willie Mays when he was playing for the Giants and Mickey playing for the Yankees. And then, of course, you know, Stan Musial, all these guys that were so And, you know, good. Roberto Clemente, yeah. too. Yeah, and, I mean, it's just the – you talk about it. I mean, the talent that was going on back then. But talk about – there was never a rivalry, but just talk about – two iconic guys playing in the same city together. It had to be special. Oh, what about, uh, uh, Willie Mays and dad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, godly. Uh, I cannot believe, uh, he played for, uh, the Dodgers, uh, Hodges. Was it or Gil Hodges? Yeah. yeah Gil yeah. Hodges. Uh, you know, all three of them were in New York. Yeah. And you think about this too. I mean, that's the other thing that I wish, Never, I know the Mets are in New York, and I have great respect for them. But I really wish that the three teams were still around because it would be so cool to go to Everett's <laughs> Field and go to the Polo Grounds. You know, things like that. I just think that somebody then, was always in town. Yeah, I think back then, if you were a baseball fan, you got you were very spoiled if you lived in that area. You got to see everything. Just think how hard it was too when you were fans. You had to pick one team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they yeah, were it, all great, though. That's the problem. I mean, all three of the teams were great. And think about this, uh, David. Obviously, the Yankees and Red Sox, they're the big rivalry. Right. But back, but back then, I would think if you asked Dad, his rivalry was with the Dodgers, not the Red Sox. That's right. And, yeah, so uh, you know, just talk it, about that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, everybody, uh, Dad loved uh, Willie, too. And, you know, they would, did, I don't know. If People have seen some of those old commercials that they did, but when they did that uh, blue bonnet uh, uh, butter commercial, Dad said it took them like all day because uh, they had uh, Willie and Dad in those little bonnets and they were eating the corn and stuff. They said every time they looked at each other, they just started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, uh, it was quite the time back then. But uh, back to that movie, the other thing... Yes. Um, the, the, the other thing that I really like, too, is that when Mickey had to obviously bow out, he was hurt. He was really there for Roger Maris. Like, he wanted to see Roger succeed. And I believe that to be true, like I said, you know, when, the t when it was happening at the time. So I really felt that Billy Crystal showed you, again, the type of support and love they had as teammates. And that, that was only their second year playing together. But you could just tell that. I, I think if you ask Mickey, Roger would have to be top five best teammates he ever had. Oh, yeah. You know, there was no uh, bitterness or anything. Dad rooted for, uh, you know, he was a teammate. And uh, that meant a lot to Dad. I mean, like I mentioned, uh, if, you know, you were on the team, man, you were his teammate. And, you know, they'd fight for each other. So, uh, you know, he wanted Roger to do it. Uh, I, You know, me personally, I wish Dad hadn't got injured. It'd be a neat to see him go all the way to the end of the season. Yeah, definitely. Now, um, the one thing in the movie that I did not like, obviously, was um, I just felt that they were really, you know, as far as um, – the announcing and stuff like I don't believe Phil Rizzuto was talking about cannolis in 1961. I think that happened more in the late 70s. And I didn't think that and no offense to the guy who played Phil. It just didn't seem like Phil Rizzuto to me. And it definitely didn't seem like Mel Allen. And no. I really feel that if you're going to have those announcers, you got to try to find people that fit the part. Yeah, that's right. I think uh, he was just trying to add something different to the movie. But uh, one thing I kind of wish, you know, dad never denied it. He did drink, but you know, I think they played that too much in the, yeah. uh, uh, the movie too, you know, like where the car wreck and all that stuff. And uh, yeah. I don't think that ever happened, but uh, you know, dad uh, never denied it. And uh, you know, he granted it, but uh, I, this is just me thinking, you know, back dad didn't, uh, he hated drugs. And so, you know, he never took anything. And I think at first, alcohol might have been kind of like his drug, you know, right. to help with the pain. And, of course, you know how alcohol is. It's a progressive disease. And he became an alcoholic. Yeah. I, And let's talk about that just a little bit. Um, Certainly. I think the big reason, though, David, is this, what I've always heard is he just saw so much loss between his uncles, his father his brothers that he just had it in his head 
that he wasn't going to make it to 50, you know, 50, oh. 55. So I think a lot of that had to play into why he had a drinking problem because it, he just felt like life was going to be short for him. Well, you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. You're right because, you know, at the time, man, oh, men didn't make it to 40. And speaking of that, you know, like my little brother, Billy, he only made it to 36. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, uh, I think you're right. Dad always said, he goes, man, I didn't think I was going to live this long. Or, you know, I, I would have done things different. Yeah, exactly. And let me ask you, just uh, you growing up as well. I mean, was that ever in the back of your mind when you were a young kid thinking to yourself, you know what, my family has a history of cancer. I mean, did you think maybe like that when you got to your 30s, you know, you weren't going to be long for this world? God, you know, I, I don't know if I, I don't think it was on my mind like dad's. But, you know, I think when dad got past uh, 45 or so and into his 50s, uh, I think he kind of let it relax or, or you know, yeah. kind of didn't, uh, was on, wasn't on his mind all the time. And, uh, but, you know, we were just glad that, you know, when dad uh, uh, retired and towards the end, you know, those last 18 months of his life, we all were together. And, you know, before that then too, we were spending a lot of time together, which was great. Right. We had the fantasy camps and, you know, we would take turns traveling with dad to uh, card shows and stuff, helping him with stuff. And uh, it was great. And, uh, you know, like I said, I kind of felt sorry for mom. You know, she always got left at home. Uh, if one of us got to go with dad because, you know, she had the other boys take care of. But, you know, every now and then one of us would get to travel with dad. Right. And just talk about his legacy uh, as a New York Yankee. And that was the other thing, David. I was having trouble remembering what I wanted to ask you about that movie. But the, that early on, they kind of have Joe DiMaggio going up to Mickey and telling him how he's going to throw out the ball for the first pitch for opening day. And they kind of you know, the camera's on Mickey and he looks sad, like, cause he feels like, uh, Joe just kind of put him in his place a little bit, but I don't believe that part to be true because in 1961, there wasn't a more famous New York Yankee at the time than Mickey Mantle. Mickey was the New York Yankees then. So I don't think that, uh, even Joe throwing out the first pitch and don't get me wrong. Joe is that very iconic. They both are, but Mickey was the guy because he was playing at the time. I don't sense that Mickey had to take a back seat to him. No, and, uh, you know, nothing against Joe either, but, you know, Dad has a lot of very faithful friends, you know, like Joe did back then. But after Joe retired, it became Dad and yeah. the other Yankees. Yeah, and, I mean, you know, it, it works both ways. When your father retired, and, I mean, they had some dry spells. I mean, you had Thurman Munson. He was that next um, big Yankee that was popular. that Thurman and Billy Martin and even Matt Lee, they should all yeah. be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, and that's the thing, too. I mean, it always goes from generation to generation. So I always thought that was a bad job by the media because, one, it made Joe look bad as a person. And I don't think Joe – like you said, Joe didn't talk a lot, but I don't necessarily think Joe was a bad person. And I really think that he loved the Yankees. And I also think that uh, Mickey had a lot of respect for Joe. Oh, and, I think, uh, and, and that was true in his speech. And I didn't play the clip. But I love in his speech when he says, if they gave me a plaque, they have to give Joe's. Yep. That's a little higher. Hanging and a little higher. He's the best Yankee I've ever seen because he didn't see Ruth or Garrett. I thought that was one of the classiest things. Like right now, I get the goosebumps talking about <laughs> it. But that just Thank goes you. to show that. He, and that's one thing, too, that I always say when somebody's having a problem, whether it's a drinking problem, a drug problem, that doesn't make them a bad person. They're just struggling with something. And that's right. true about your father because. He was always a good person. You could just see that. And doing something classy like that and talking about Joe when the day is about him, I thought that was just tremendous. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. But it's like Dad said, he goes, they'll have to hang Joe's just a little bit higher. Yeah, exactly. So let me ask you, uh, David. I mean, you talked to me about it a little bit, and you had said that you guys struggled a little bit with alcoholism and stuff oh, like yeah, that. Yeah, we all but took I, our turns, too. Yeah, but I also think that you guys really were a true family in the sense that you guys helped each other. Nobody, everybody sensed that there was go problems going on. And I believe it was you, your mother, and your brothers who went into the uh, 
the Betty Ford first and you convinced dad that he needed to do it as well. And he did. So, I mean, that's what a family is really about. You guys helped each other. Yeah, it's funny. It was our youngest brother, Danny, that got it started. <laughs> yeah, he was the youngest. And he was out in California with dad doing some stuff. And uh, dad comes back and he goes, where's Danny? And we're going, I don't know. We didn't know that he had checked in. <laughs> right. But he, uh, we end up, uh, he made a call and said he's at Betty Ford's. So, you know, that, that got dad thinking and all of us. Yeah. And the one thing too, uh, David, that, and it was unfortunate because he would pass a few weeks later and we'll get into that in a little bit, but I just want to talk about what he said to the fans on old timers day. He was in uniform and he was obviously going through treatments, but one thing he told the fans, he goes, don't be like me. And what he meant by that is don't try to live your life. Like I did do good things, you know, things like that. Don't abuse your body. And I just, that's what I always think about your father. Uh, great ball player, but an even classier person because he basically was sending that message that this stuff will hurt you if you let it. Yeah, I mean, I remember saying, he goes, uh, uh, I'm not a hero. You know, and he kind of says some stuff. But he goes, uh, you want to be a hero? Don't be like me. He goes, you know, God gave me this body and this life, and I just it away. Yeah, and I mean... The thing of it is, too, uh, David. I is, think he's a little hard on himself, but yeah, he definitely was. And the the great thing, though, about your father is you look at all the people who idolized him over the years and got to meet him. And sometimes you meet your idol, and they are not what you want them to be. Like you root for them. You know, I could think I'm not going to mention the baseball player's name, but I really enjoyed watching him pitch. And then I got to see him at Yankee Stadium. I asked for an autograph, and I'm 10 years old. And he goes, I'm not signing. That really bothered me. But your father, like Billy Crystal has said it, Bob Costas has said it, he was just a gentleman to everybody he came across. And that, to me, just speaks volumes about the type of man he is. I remember one time, like what you mentioned, it. you know, uh, towards the end, Dad got signed, tired of signing, like, cocktail napkins and all that. So, you know, you've probably seen him. He had those uh, cards made up, and he would carry them with him, and he'd sign them, and he'd pass those out to kids. And I remember one time, I think it was we were here in Dallas, or it might have been somewhere. Maybe we were in New York. I don't know, but somebody came up and uh, uh, asked him for one, and I don't know what it was. Dad says, uh, not right now, and the guy kind of, Walked away and dad gave me, he goes, man, go get, I had to like run the guy down and give it to him. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, that, that really is who he is. Two um, milestones I really want to talk about. Well, one is a tribute, but the other is a milestone. So we'll start with that. Okay. You know. I, I am sure that you were there the day he hit his 500th home run. Talk about that moment because that had to be a special moment for you and your family. God, I wish we were, but you know, that was on, uh, he called mom up and said, uh, it was Mother's Day. Yeah. And uh, he told her uh, that day, I, they might have been there, or maybe, and maybe Junior would got to go, but uh, we weren't there. But uh, he told mom, he goes, I'm going to hit a home run for you today. And he did. Yeah. And I mean, he hit it off Denny McLean, if I remember. Who yes. Was a tremendous <laughs> pitcher. I tell so. you what, Denny's a great guy, too. I've got to talk to him a few times. Yeah, and I mean, that was just like a great moment. Let me ask you this, too. You know, I um, think Danny, I don't know what he got, but uh, I think his manager, uh, they fined him for uh, uh, throwing him a pitch. And people don't realize that, too. That was one thing they brought up in the movie, too. Um, when the guy, the pitcher, was pitching to Roger, the manager said, if you uh, give him anything to hit, I'll uh, fine you. Back oh, yeah. then, Back then, it doesn't happen now, obviously, but back then, I mean – a lot of times, if you didn't do what the manager wanted, they could do that to you. So people yep. forget that as well. No, back then, it, it was uh, – it, it's like Dad said, you know, uh, back when he played, the players were stupid and the owners were smart. And then he goes, but nowadays, the players are smart and the owners are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, back – I was thinking about his 500th home run, and I – you know, wish they would show more games where I could see that stadium better because I only remember the updated one in 1976, which I loved. I yep. loved it so much. Um, you got to see both. I, I'm sure you prefer the first stadium, 
but just talk about being at both. What was what was it like for you? I mean, all I I I love old Yankee Stadium, and I am to this day. You know, when they remodeled it in what seventy five or something yeah. like that, uh, maybe yeah seventy four or five, whatever it was. Uh, man, it 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 kind of you know. I don't know. It bummed me out. I just wonder what dad thought too. But, uh, you know, I just remember the way it was that when we were young, how us kids ran around and, you know, you get used to those smells. <clears throat> and then even uh, after the remodel, there was still a lot of, uh, of the old Yankee stadium there. And when we would walk around, uh, Mickey Jr. remembers a lot more of it than I do really. But he goes, David, man, remember these we we're walking down the hall to, uh, underneath the stadium going to the locker room and he would go man remember these he's talking about the walls and everything but right. man, they tore down the, the uh original i i just think every player that stepped onto that grass it's gone yeah that history's it, gone yeah and i again for me like i said i remember the updated version 76 when they closed it down after the 2008 season it's been very hard like I will always love the Yankees, but since they've been in this new stadium, there, there's times it just doesn't feel like Yankee Stadium to me. And that's a tough thing for a fan who saw some, you know, unbelievable moments. That's a tough yeah, thing it, to go through. It's really sad for us old guys. The mystique is gone. And uh, now it's just, I think, uh, you know, the owners now, they're they're trying to, uh, you know, I guess capture a new uh, – audience and stuff but man you know i mean they're still fenway and wrigley and uh i don't see any problem with them yeah exactly and i mean that's a great job by both those stadiums and well those teams that they have kept those uh stadiums because yeah. really they're the last true stadiums that we have in baseball that's so, right so, uh, but yeah, you know ahead. it's funny i i've never been to fenway or wrigley and uh it's kind of on my list now, Danny, uh, you know, it's just me and him now. He's got a friend that lives in Boston now. He moved from here up to Boston, and uh, Danny's been up there to visit him, and uh, they've been to uh, – and he got to go to a couple of games at Fenway. So I said, man, next time I'm going with you because I, I just want to see the park and the green wall. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is beautiful. I mean, and I'm a Yankees fan, so – this is a Yankees fan saying it, but it really is a beautiful ballpark because it's got such nostalgic, you know, That's things it. to it. But, um, you know, you brought up Danny. A lot of people may not realize this, but, I mean, Danny fought back from a an illness that it looked like, you know, he was, again, that cancer was going to get him, and he really fought and fought. And that's really a tribute to him because that was not an easy cancer to come back from. No, and, you know, of course, Mickey Jr., uh, got the dadgum cancer too and uh you know it got uh billy and then of course uh from the cancer billy's heart just wore out and uh but mickey jr uh got it also and uh that was no fun to watch and uh you know just kind of speaking about it i don't i don't know how mom uh did it you know burying two of her sons and uh her husband yeah i mean it's just it shows like the type of toughness your family has though, because I mean, I don't know. I, I don't want to speak for you guys, but it almost seems like tragedy made your family stronger. I think it did. And, uh, you know, but also too, uh, mom and dad, uh, made us stronger too. And, uh, you know, I, you know, mom was, uh, that, you know, raised in Oklahoma too. Just, uh, that's where they met was, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, different uh, little towns that were next to each other. It was at a football game, and uh, Dad was on a blind date, and he met Mom, and then all of a sudden they started dating. <laughs> but uh, it 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 was uh, it it was meant to be. Thank goodness. Right now, the other uh, thing I I wanted to bring up, and we talked about it briefly about how he uh, put Joe DiMaggio over that day, but yes, talk to me about Mickey Mantle Day because. For you as a son, and I'm sure you look back on it. And I think um, I'm trying to remember which brother talked. Mickey about Jr. It. got to go. Uh, yeah, he was a little bit older, and I wish all of us could have gone, but we didn't get to go. But uh, and I should ask Mickey Jr. more about it. But 
I can just remember that one picture where it's got him and dad and mom out there on the field and it, Mickey Jr. just kind of like going, man, what am I doing? <laughs> and if you remember, David, all you have to do is watch the film that they have yeah. on it. I think that audience clapped for eight minutes straight before they finally yes. stopped. So, I mean, that is one of those priceless moments that, you know, you, you can never really duplicate. I mean, that was just awesome that that's how much he meant to those fans because there's so many struggles in everyday life and you've talked about it a little bit. And then you have days like that, that make it all, you know, that kind of, it's an escape for so many people. So that day for those fans, that was something they loved. And I mean, that had to be, I mean, I don't care how big of a star your father was and all that. He had to feel like a little kid that day getting that over. Oh, I, I, I think that's what started bringing the tears to his eyes. You know, he just, he, he never really knew or accepted how much he was truly loved by yeah. the fans and stuff and New York. It was just, uh, he, he never just, you don't know it, but you know, it's like he told us, uh, he, he was just one of the players and, uh, it, it was. Up, oh, I lost them for a second. We'll see. If uh, we can... It was just one of our, you know. He was just one of the teammates, but uh, it's just like I mentioned. Dad said, you know, he learned to be humble, and he goes, my boys better be humble, too. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that. Um, I could watch that all day, and luckily, uh, if you ever want to watch it, for anybody who hasn't seen oh, it, yeah. it's on YouTube. And what what's really... That's where we go thing, a lot. <laughs> yeah. One thing I didn't realize, David, is uh, how he kind of had a friendship with Pat Summerall as well. And, yeah, you know, Pat, Pat I think talked to him about Betty Ford's also. Yeah. And I believe Pat was uh, the announcer that day. Like, uh, you know, he wasn't the MC, but he was the announcer for the game. And he was kind of telling the fans all about it, you know, the different yep. images. So, I mean, and Pat struggled with alcoholism as well. Yeah. Well, see, that's what I was saying. Uh, Pat also talked to him about Betty Ford's. That's where Pat gone too. Right. And I mean, that was just an unbelievable day. And into retirement, David, one thing I think the Yankees were so great at doing, and they do this with a lot of their players, you see it all the time, is they do appreciate what these players meant to their organization. And that's one thing about George Steinbrenner. And I know fans have the, their opinions about him. I loved him because I just felt like he always tried to make this team win. But George... He could make mistakes, but he could also correct a lot of mistakes, too. Well, everybody he, makes mistakes. Yeah, and he was very good about recognizing these past Yankees, and he's a big reason Roger Maris came back to Yankee Stadium. I, I really believe I think it is because uh, I don't know why Roger, you know, I, we're glad he did because that, that was a great day, too, that Roger came back. Yeah, and I just love um, – <laughs> that was awesome when uh, – your your Roger was getting introduced. He's coming out to the mound and he pretends he's going to deck your father because they knew that the media <laughs> tried to play that up. And I just oh, thought, no, was, <laughs> yeah. and I thought that was a, a great image. And just seeing them raise the banner for the uh, 20, 21st championship because they had had a drought for you know since sixty two. So that was a special moment. But those yep. are things that I always loved is that. I didn't get to see your father play, but I got to see him on Yankees broadcast. He would do a lot of stuff with Sports Channel. And, I mean, you always got to see him. So he was still in the spotlight long after retiring. I'll tell you, I got another story. It was at dinner, and Dad goes, I bet you all didn't even know what I did today at the ball game. And we were there, but, you know, we were always just with the other ball players' kids running around having fun. And he goes, I bet you all didn't even know what I did today. And we're going. Uh, I don't know, or, you know, we're all looking like what, you know, and I, I can't remember. I think it, I know he hit two home runs, but was there ever a game where he hit three home runs? Yeah. I mean, I, I would have to go back and look, but I would think it was something did. like that. Yeah. I know it was two, but I don't know why someone told me maybe three one time, but uh, he told us what he did that day and we're all going, okay, <laughs> you know, we're just eating away yeah. and hell, we had fun running around with the ball players, kids. And speaking of which, you talk about home runs. There's always the one game, and I wish I could have saw it, and I wish there was film of it, but he did hit the facade of Yankee Stadium, which nobody oh. has ever hit it out of the park. 
he almost hit it out of the park. So just talk about that a little bit. God, I wish there was film. But, you know, you see those drawings of it. And everybody there, uh, dad's teammates and stuff, said they never heard a ball hit that hard. You, you can just tell when the ball comes off the bat, you can tell. I mean, I yeah. can do that today. I'll be at a ball. And when you say, man, as soon as it's hit, I go, that's a home run. I You can just tell by the sound. And uh, But, God, when that thing uh, – flew up there and that well, after it hit the facade you know it bounced back almost to the infield yeah and i mean and i i you know i bet dad wish you know he's not the type to brag or anything like, or, or you know uh yeah i guess brag and stuff but i bet he probably wished it went out but i i know i do i really do i go why couldn't it been a little more to the left yeah but i mean the fact that he did that and you know, that brings that lets me segue into the next thing I was going to bring up. As strong of a guy as he was, people don't realize this, too. He was as fast as anybody in baseball. Oh. And that's very rare when somebody is a power hitter like that, strong like that, to be super fast as well. He was 3.1 uh, uh, left handed and I think 3.2 or 3, something like that, uh, right handed. But if uh, he was really fast around to the uh, the bases and the first base. And if you ever see him, like, even if he's uh, bunting, I mean, he's already headed to first. And the only thing over the plate is the bat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just remarkable. Talk to me a little bit, uh, David, about the friends he made in baseball. You know, Whitey Ford and him were very close. Yogi, obviously, we talked about Roger. I think, though, him and Elston Howard became real good friends as well. Yes, and they I were. Mean, he really loved Elston. Yes, he did. And, uh, you know, that was going through that dadgum time in America. And, uh, uh, you know, dad would sit on the bus and uh, would get their dinners and he'd sit out there and eat with Elson. And then, uh, you know, other players started coming out and eating on the bus with him. You know, when, uh, you know, he wasn't allowed in there if it was in the South or something. Right. And I mean, that's just the thing that stands out to me the most about your father is he was a uh superstar player we know this he was probably the most famous player in baseball him and Willie Mays I would say both of them at the time and yet he was still a humble person I mean he was still a great teammate he was a friend yeah and he, was, he, he was a father and that's the thing too no matter what he struggled with in his life I think you and your brothers have always said this that he was a tremendous father yeah people think that you know because of him being gone I was going well, you know, think of other people. What, what about somebody's father that's in the military, uh, never home or might not come home, you know, and stuff like that. It's just, you know, that was his job. And, you know, shoot, he, he did what he loved and he was good at it. And, you know, we respected it. And, uh, you know, I think because of him and mom coming from uh, the small towns in Oklahoma, that's why uh, we're still, uh, you know, so... Uh, you know, humble ourselves. We've never bragged about it. We're very proud of him and, you know, proud of mom too. But, uh, you know, we were just, we're just another, you know, brothers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, David, um, though it was a difficult day for you and your family, I think one thing that you look back at and you're, you could have, you know, a little peace with is, uh, and take comfort in, is just how many people showed up for your father's funeral. And God, I'll tell you, Bob Costas, you know, oh, he took yeah. a little he took a little criticism recently for uh not having a great playoff game this past uh, fall. But I'll tell you what, that guy is an unbelievable person as well. And what a eulogy he gave on your father. It was one of the best I've ever heard. Oh, he did a great job too. And then, you know, what about one of dad's teammates, Bobby Richardson? Yes. Uh yeah. Bobby came, you know, they all came down. Uh, you know, to kind of say goodbyes to each other. But Bobby, when he came down, we all left the room and it was just him and Bobby. And, uh, you know, Bobby's very religious. So him and dad had that talk. And uh, it it was, you know, really great that Bobby did that. And in fact, you know, he's one of uh, dad's teammates that's still with us. And uh, about two weeks ago, uh, I talked to him and Betsy. Yeah, I called him up and said hello. Yeah. And I mean, just the outpouring of love that 
you saw, I mean, you saw so many people show up. Uh, you saw past oh. Yankees. I mean, uh, celebrities, uh, longtime friends, people from high school that he went with. I mean, it was just like, that was what really told me about your father is just the amount of people that showed up for his funeral that day. I mean, it was a very moving funeral. Yeah. I, I, I think I was in a daze too. I think all of us in the family were, uh, at least I know I was, I wish I remembered more about it, but man, it was just like, you know, I, it was like, you know, why I wish I wasn't here. Yeah, exactly. So David, um, talk to the people about today, uh, how you have, done a tremendous job keeping his legacy alive and the great things you're doing in your life because you and Danny have uh like I said I brought this up earlier in the interview you guys have um really made your parents very proud well I think we have of course you know I I don't like I'm not trying to brag or anything but you know because of dad we've uh you know there's been a lot of opportunities and uh you know we uh have the foundation that's uh not as uh, we don't really do too much as the Mickey Mantle Foundation anymore. But what I've really been doing a lot to me and Danny and stuff is uh, we're helping our veterans out. And I've got a friend that's in town right now, uh, Garrett George. He's the one that uh, puts on a lot of stuff. But we uh, I'll travel around with him and uh, I get by stuff and uh, we go meet uh, veterans and, uh, you know, welcome them home or whatever. And, uh, you know, I just try to entertain them for the weekend or whatever we do or for the week. And it's just, you know, that's my thing right now. It's just trying to get back to them. And, you know, it's not just the military, it's just all like firefighters, uh, police, everything. Well, I think what you're doing is wonderful. And I really, like I said, I mean, talking to you the past week or so has been great. And I mean, I think what you and your brother have been doing again, your parents would be very proud, but I really do thank you for giving me some time today to share some great stories about your father, your family, everything. And um, I really do applaud the stuff you do. And I just hope you know that your father's legacy will never die. It'll remain forever. Well, I tell you what, man, it's uh, for fans like you that we really appreciate that keep dad's name out there. Like I'd mentioned to you in a text and uh, man, you just, uh, you get hold of me anytime you want. You've got my number. And uh, hopefully one time, uh, talk to Billy, too. And if I need to, we can go over to Danny's or Billy's or whatever. Or maybe I'll have a computer back by, or another computer by then. And uh, man, get all of us together. I would love to do that. That would be so much I tell fun. You what, so. me, and, me and Billy, we love being together talking. We, we just we work off of each other so good. It, it's just it's great. Yeah, and he was awesome as well. And um, I think he's again, a character, David, man. He's yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like but, his dad to me. Yeah, but um, real nice guy. I mean, he was a pleasure to have on. But uh, David, I really do thank you for uh, giving me the time today. You're a class act, and thank you so much for this. I really, well, do man, appreciate I appreciate it. that, and just thank you, and uh, thank all the fans. Uh, but man, I really appreciate, it, and I mean it. You, you ever need anything, you give me a call. Well, I appreciate that very much. And folks, you just got to listen to David Mantle for this past hour. You know, for Mickey Mantle fans everywhere, you look at David and David is proof of the type of person that Mickey Mantle was. I mean, tremendous baseball player, great athlete. We know all this, but when you look at Mickey Mantle, you have to also talk about how he was as a family, you know, raising a family. As a father and, and a yeah, husband. As a father and a husband. And David, Danny, these guys are proof of just the type of father Mickey was. And to me, Mickey Mantle is a great baseball player, but he was an even better person. For In the Spotlight, I'm Mike Kenichi. That's David Mantle oh, saying good night, everyone. One, one yep. more thing, please. Uh, uh, to all the fans and to you, next time we do talk, I've just been lazy this last winter, but uh, this is going to be gone in about a couple of days. <laughs> so uh, I'm getting ready for summer now. Yeah, and folks, uh, before I go, David did share with me before we came on that uh, if Dad were alive today, that beard oh, yeah. would have been off for this interview. <laughs> oh, he, he would. If I didn't shave it, he would have pulled it out. <laughs> Thank you again, David, for Thank in the you, spotlight. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you, buddy, for in the spotlight. I'm Mike Kanichi saying good night, everyone. Bye bye.